generations to come will scarcely believe that a man such as this ever walked this earth. So said Albert Einstein about Mahatma Gandhi, the apostle of peace, and one of the greatest men of the 20th century. The same could be said for Nelson Mandela, another icon of our times. Both Gandhi and Mandela stood for peace, for reconciliation, and above all, for the dignity of man. Both fought for freedom, freedom for every man and woman, regardless of caste, creed, or color. And both belong to not only their own countries, India and South Africa, but to the whole of mankind. It is to these two great souls that this film is dedicated. Durban, a pretty city on the east coast of South Africa. With its beautiful coastline and elegant colonial buildings, Durban is a good mix of the old and the new, the historic and the modern. It is also the city where a large number of people of Indian origin live. People like the Lachmans, a middle-class South African family. Father Anil is an accountant, while Mother Suchitra is a housewife. In their modest home in Chatsworth, a far-flung suburb, where many Indian families were dumped by the apartheid government, the Lachmans managed to keep a feel of their Indianness. Like many others of the Indian community here, whose forefathers came to this country over 140 years ago to work on sugar plantations, the Lachmans have not been able to visit India and have little idea where they originally hail from. I haven't had the opportunity of actually um, going back to, uh, to my grandfathers and such, obviously none of them are living at the moment, to actually backtrace and see exactly where our ancestors came from. Although that would be a good thing to know. The nearly 1.3 million members of the Indian community in South Africa constitute barely 3% of the total population. In the province of KwaZulu-Natal, however, and in the city of Durban, they're a very visible minority. A little bit of India can be seen all over this pretty city, and it adds a special color and flavor to the rainbow nation of South Africa. And while the Indian community is fully integrated into the local economic, political, and social landscape, they have a cultural connection with India. It is a connection they rejoice in, one that does not in any way come in the way of their South African identity. Despite having been cut off from the mother country for several generations, the Indian community of South Africa managed to keep many of its cultural traits and traditions intact. Religious rituals are still closely followed. And a havan in Durban is no different from one in India. And I'm married to Kanma, I'm a South African Nivas to Aveche, Barna Aveche, the local Nekadi, the Terrano Mokomareche. Though not everyone speaks their old mother tongues or wear Indian clothes except for special occasions, the Indian community is now slowly rediscovering its roots. Indian songs and dances are specially popular, and Indian South Africans enjoy watching the same films as their counterparts in India. Yet, they have no conflict of loyalty and continue to be proud South Africans. They are a unique bridge between the two countries, 
heirs to a history that goes back a long time. In the late 15th century, the colonial powers of the Occident were busy trying to discover the sea route to the fabled Indies, where the promise of riches lay. After many unsuccessful attempts by seafarers, the Portuguese sailor Vasco da Gama finally succeeded in reaching Indian shores in the late 15th century after rounding the Cape. A century and a half later, in the middle of the 17th century, the first Dutch settlers, heading home from the Dutch East Indies, a modern-day Indonesia, landed in the Cape. There are some accounts of Bengali slaves picked up by the early Dutch along the way, but little evidence remains of that. With slavery at an end, British plantation owners in Natal and elsewhere desperately wanted cheap labor to work for them. They turned to look eastwards to their other colonies. That is where India helped out. The Indian government and the South African government or the colony, the Natal colonial government, they had negotiations and then they agreed to have labor indentured from India uh, to South Africa. And this labor came in the main from the South and uh, to a very large extent from the UP province in the North. Following on the wake, you also had some free Indians who came mainly from Gujarat. Thousands of Indians from different parts of British-ruled India left their humble villages in North, West and South India to head for Mauritius, Fiji, the Caribbean and South Africa to work in the sugar fields. They were to work for five years and then were promised a return journey. But working conditions were primitive and life on the plantations was, in some ways, even worse than slavery. Under slavery, the master had a kind of a patriarchal ownership of the slave. So he looked after his slave. Also, he had paid a large amount for the slave and he felt that he wanted to get the maximum labor out of him for the maximum period of time. So he looked after his health and he saw that the slave was a fit person. This never happened on the sugar plantations. Uh, you felt you had this man's labor for five years and you extorted the maximum that you could with the minimum amount of input. So the conditions on the sugar plantations were extremely bad. Yet they began settling down and managed to retain some cultural and religious traditions, some of which have been retained even to this day. They were soon joined by their fellow Indians called the Passengers, who paid their own way to reach South Africa. The Passengers, who were mainly from Gujarat, were merchants and petty traders who supplied special goods and rations to the indentured labor. They came with money and soon spread out into African areas where they became more successful than white shopkeepers, leading to resentment. Some passenger Indians also came in the early part of the 20th century from the coastal regions of Western India like Ratnagiri and Raigarh, leaving their lush homelands for an unknown country in search of a better life, they made their way to Cape Town, where they settled down. Called the Konkanis, till recently not much was known about them. Ali Mia Firfire, a community leader who came here at the age of 12, explains that their language skills are slowly fading away as the younger generation fully integrates with the rest of the country. That is now dwindling a little bit because of the fact that uh, first the language, you know, we used to speak in the home our Cockney language or Urdu. Nowadays, they, they, you know, our, even our uh, wives and, and uh, children, they, they just speak English or Afrikaans. And that has cut the link. Now, they, we got literal societies here which are trying to uh, propagate that and encourage the, uh, uh, what is it? It's, it's uphill struggle. By the late 19th century, despite hardships and discrimination by the ruling whites, 
the Indians had settled in Natal and reports of a better life attracted more of their fellow countrymen. Among the new visitors was a young London educated lawyer, Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, who had an unpleasant introduction to South Africa. When he came here, he was, um, you know, like many other people, just looking for fortune and wealth. But uh, his, um, you know, very entry into South Africa was so traumatic, you know, that uh, soon after he arrived, he was thrown off the train and he experienced the blatant racism. He um, was touched by this and uh, his entire, that was perhaps the turning point in his life. Shocked by the blatant racism in Natal and elsewhere, Mohandas set about involving himself in local politics. And it was here that many of his early ideas about passive resistance and community living were born. He founded the Natal Indian Congress in 1895 and then set up a settlement on a hundred acres of land in Phoenix on the outskirts of Durban. Many prominent thinkers came here to discuss political and social issues with Gandhi and it was here that he began publishing his newspaper The Indian Opinion. It was also in Phoenix that Gandhi's family son Manilal and daughter-in-law Sushila settled down to carry on Gandhi's good work even after he left. Phoenix became the center of political activity but in 1985 because of the apartheid government's policy of trying to divide the other communities the ashram was attacked by rioters and burnt down. Today the Phoenix settlement is rising again. Helped by a grant by the Indian and South African governments, a monument to Gandhi's ideals, which continue to be relevant in today's South Africa. Gandhi's granddaughter, Ila, a political activist who was jailed by the apartheid government and is now an MP of the African National Congress, has carried on the family tradition of fighting injustice. Gandhi's political activism fired the imagination of the Indians who came together to fight the ruling whites. A similar fire was also burning among black Africans who had been subjugated by racist rulers for centuries. In 1913, under the presidentship of Dr. John Dube, they set up the African National Congress to fight for the rights of the oppressed people of South Africa. The founding of the Natal Indian Congress in the 1890s uh, was already a continuation of a relationship between, uh, between our country and, uh, and India. And uh, uh, it is even at the founding of the African National Congress, the name Congress seemed to have been uh, drawn from the uh, All India Congress history, the history of the Natal Indian uh, Congress which had, uh, uh, in, the early, in the early years, made a huge impact uh, amongst our people, was uh, uh, to culminate in popularizing the name Congress. And uh, I think a lot of uh, the, the early years of struggle uh, in this country were also heavily impacted upon by the Indian community in South Africa, Natal, uh, the old Natal and the old Transvaal. But uh, in the intervening years, especially after Ma the great Mahatma Gandhi had gone back to India and so on, South African Congress leaders uh, uh, kept uh, contact. Mohandas Gandhi left the shores of South Africa forever in 1914, but kept an abiding interest in its problems. The Indian National Congress was in close touch with leaders of the South African Indian Congress and provided moral support to the struggle against white domination which was intensifying. The Indian community of South Africa too took part in a big way in this fight. Prominent activists such as Dr. Yusuf Dadu were in the forefront of the struggle for equality and hundreds of men and women participated in passive resistance campaigns. 
The late 1940s saw major changes in both countries. In 1947, India shrugged off the yoke of colonial rule and took its place in the Committee of Nations. Long years ago, we made a tryst with destiny. The very next year, a new, dark chapter began in the troubled history of South Africa. The newly victorious National Party imposed a pernicious and racist system of segregation. They called it apartheid. People were classified according to race, with whites at the top of a new hierarchical order. Like many other countries, India was outraged by this and broke off all diplomatic ties with South Africa. India was also among the first countries to demand that South Africa be thrown out of the United Nations. Important points here that we must emphasize is, first of all, India took a moral stand. Despite the fact that in terms of economics, material exigencies, it was better for her to have continued with that trade. Her moral stance is very, very important. It means that you are looking at an India newly liberated, but still filled with the fervor of the liberation morality. That is very important. Secondly, India was the first country to start the whole sanction movement against South Africa because of her racism. With apartheid came even more suppression of the fundamental rights of blacks, Indians, and all non-Europeans. Anyone who opposed the regime was victimized. People were killed, jailed, or thrown out of the country. Hundreds of activists were arrested. The more prominent political activists were shifted to one of the world's most notorious prisons, Robben Island. Situated barely half an hour's boat ride from Cape Town, today Robben Island has become a tourist attraction, but it still stands as a testimony to man's inhumanity and to the fortitude and courage of those who fight such cruelty. Robben Island was a leper colony at one time. In the 1960s, it was converted to a high security prison with hundreds of prisoners, including a few in solitary confinement, kept there simply because they were fighting for their rights. The most famous prisoner was undoubtedly Nelson Mandela, a young lawyer sentenced in 1962 to life imprisonment on charges of treason. He was kept in the notorious Section B, where only the most serious cases were jailed. It was in this bleak cell that Mandela dreamed of a genuinely non-racial, democratic South Africa. Today the cells are empty, but they resound with the voices of those who sacrificed their best years for their country. The apartheid regime continued its inhumane policies and put down all protests brutally. It also made laws that deprived non-whites of their livelihood and property. One such was the Group Areas Act, under which the government could forfeit any property in the name of segregating the races. Thousands of people lost their homes and were dumped far away from the city center. Among the victims was Sunil Bramdor, a newspaper publisher who recalls those bitter days. The Group Areas uh, inspectors hounded us again and uh, asked us to leave within two weeks. Uh, at that time, my uh, youngest son was two weeks old, and uh, it was quite traumatic for the family to uproot itself uh, once again. We were given two weeks to clear, uh, clear out of the house. The Indian community was suffering on another count too. Cut off from their mother country and unable to travel freely, they were fast losing their culture. The Indian government realized this and allowed Hindi films to get through to South Africa. But it was not only the plight of the Indians that India was concerned about. For India, the whole apartheid edifice was immoral. There is almost uh, a virtual unanimity in the General Assembly that apartheid is uh, something abominable, something abhorrent. 
uh, one may have some uh, differences about the words to use. Some might call it a crime against humanity. Others might call it an offense against human dignity. But there is this unanimity against apartheid. Uh, there is the unanimity that apartheid is uh, dangerous to international peace and security. India, like the rest of the world, was shocked at the way the white National Party government put down all forms of resistance. The apartheid regime did not even stop at killing young school students protesting against the imposition of Afrikaans as a medium of education. Sharpeville, 1976 became the symbol of defiance of a brutal and moral regime. It was a period of agitation and protest, a time of great ferment, as political opposition within South Africa rose to unprecedented levels. The white regime of the country stuck to its refusal to give full representation to the majority, despite worldwide condemnation. What I say is that I'm not prepared to accept a system of one man, one vote, and majority government in South Africa. Throughout the 1970s and 1980s, India kept up pressure on South Africa, arguing for sanctions and a general boycott while supporting the liberation forces. In international forums, like the Commonwealth Heads of Government meetings, India demanded that sanctions be imposed on racist South Africa, while voicing its support for the oppressed majority. Let us remember that in the final reckoning, it is not we who will bring about a change in South Africa, but the people of South Africa themselves. They will win through their valor, their inflexible will, their infinite capacity for sacrifice. They have borne much. They will bear more. Let us not underrate the revolutionary might of the freedom fighters. We know from experience in India that the dawn breaks when the night appears its darkest. But global opposition to South Africa's apartheid government was growing, and the struggles of the oppressed peoples of South Africa began bearing fruit. In 1990, the world's most famous political prisoner, Nelson Mandela, was released, bringing hope and joy to millions of ordinary South Africans and to people all around the world. His first visit outside South Africa was to India, where he was awarded the country's highest civilian honor, the Bharat Ratna, the Jewel of India. Events moved swiftly after that. The National Party, under F.W. de Klerk, began talks with the African National Congress for a smooth democratic transition to a new South Africa. Our ultimate goal is a new democratic dispensation for South Africa and all its people. The process of attaining this is underway, and I trust that these discussions will be another milestone on the road to a new and just South Africa. After months of painstaking negotiations, the first ever democratic elections were held in South Africa in 1994. And soon after, the first ever black majority government was sworn in. The journey, begun by Mohandas Gandhi a century ago in South Africa, had finally culminated. And in the fitness of things, an award named after that great son of India was given to a great son of South Africa, Nelson Mandela, in Delhi in early 2001. It was a fitting tribute to a man who had devoted his entire life to the fight against injustice.